hi guys it is a spectacularly gorgeous Tuesday afternoon July 15 2014 here in the paradise the pornographic paradise I guess you would call it of Prairie Creek Redwoods State Park in Oric California even though it's Tuesday I'm gonna pretend like it's Sunday and I'm going to bring you a little doomsday sermonette on this absolutely gorgeous day. This is the second reading I've done from my new favorite Bible of the Apocalypse called Naked Writers Uncover the Way We Live on Earth, edited by a woman named Susan Zakin, Z-A-K-I-N. And this is going to be a reading from a writer, again, that I have never heard of, named Lydia Millet. Lydia Millet. And her little essay on the way people live on Earth is called Die Baby Harp Seal. And she wrote this in 2003. And I hope Lydia, who owns the copyright, does not mind me sharing this excellent little uh, sermon. And I'm just going to read the whole thing here, guys. And you can decide what you think about this. Die, baby harp seal. <clears throat> I am gazing wistfully at a towering red rock butte bathed in gentle sunlight, shades of brown to violet framed against a meek background of sky. It is massive but tame, brooding but well-mannered, broad-shouldered but shy. Its silence is nothing short of submissive. In short, it is the January pinup in the Nature Conservancy's calendar. Environmental organizations and independent entrepreneurs yearly churn out glossy wall charts and engagement books for the consumption of nature-loving citizens like myself. Grizzly cubs from the Nature Conservancy are on the menu, for instance. Spotted dolphins and two albatrosses with their beaks interlocked from the Sierra Club and from Audubon, a polar bear perched with all four paws together like a performing bear in a circus, as well as a mother and baby baboon and mother and baby koala, perfectly groomed, hugging each other cutely and looking straight at the camera with big, dark, inviting pools of eyes. As I flip through these adorable menageries, I am reminded of nothing so much as my 20-something days working for slaves wages as a copy editor at Hustler magazine. I am reminded of models named Tammy and Linda, buck naked and intertwined, long tresses artfully arranged to frame obscenely augmented breasts who also hugged each other, though not so cutely, and looked straight at the camera with their big, dark, inviting pools of eyes. Sometimes, as copy editor, I had to pen what are called girl tags, lines of loopy, babyish script, ostensibly the model's own, scrawled over the copper-toned silicone bodies in a vacuous and beckoning voice in a leopard-skin-clad jungle-themed photo set, Purr, yours to maul, love, Tammy. At first glance, a girl-girl spread in Hustler has little in common with a twin albatross picture in an Audubon engagement calendar. For one thing, the latter doesn't sell on newsstands in a brown wrapper, but both are clearly porn. They offer to viewer 
to the viewer the illusions of control, ownership, and subjugation. They tell us to take comfort. They will always be there, ideal, unblemished, available. They offer gratification without social cost, satiate by providing objects for fantasy without making uncomfortable demands on the subject. The landscape photographs featured in these calendars may not play quite as facilely on the heartstrings of the average American wildlife consumer as baby animals, but they too are blatantly pornographic. We see the Grand Canyon, cliffs lit orange with snow in the foreground. We see a fuchsia fog unrolling endlessly over Ross Lake in the northern Cascades under a golden sky. We see an emerald green pool surrounded by red rock in Havasu Canyon. In a day book called Heaven on Earth, we see lush trees, river scenes, and rolling green landscapes with pithy pastoral proverbs accompanying each image. This is picture book nature, scenic and sublime, praiseworthy, but not battle-worthy. Tarted up into perfectly circumcised simulations of the wild, these props of mainstream environmentalism serve as surrogates for real engagement with wilderness the way porn models serve as surrogates for real women. They are a voyeur's vice, a utopian habit, placebos substituting for triage. To add insult to injury, they don't even get us off. At least Hustler is reliable. <clears throat> but nature calendars rely on a hackneyed canon of evocations that no longer serves any purpose. Their girlish good looks have aged poorly, at best. They elicit a regretful nostalgia for a never-known past of unspoiled landscapes. At worst, they reassure us disingenuously that the last great places are safe and sound. They go largely unnoticed as they drop through the mail slot even hanging on the wall in office carols or beside telephones. They're nothing more than cheap wallpaper. And there goes my camera falling off into the porn of the giant redwood trees. So let me try to reset my camera. I have no idea whether your old porno model here is in focus or not. Yet they read a broad truth about the environmental movement. It has failed to generate a compelling language for itself. Its propaganda falls flat. Its style is outdated. Its rhetoric is stale. It needs to be reborn talking about the environmental movement in this country and on this planet needs to be reborn. A straight line can be drawn between the complacent prettiness of the conservation aesthetic and the vaguely Dutch, vaguely golf course universe lived in by the BBC's Teletubbies, complete with fake flowers and fuzzy bunnies hopping to and fro, which is apparently serving as a fair approximation of nature for a new generation of infants. What the natural world actually looks like these days is neither airbrush nor pastoral. It's more like 
120 days of Sodom. You could have fooled me here in this middle of this porno spread here in this redwood grove. To a generation that feeds on novelty and violence, whose cinema and video games and TV are hopped up full frontal assault of jump cuts and dizzying handy cam movement, whose music is amphetamine driven and whose news is always already bad. The environmental movement pathetically and stubbornly offers up static postcards of hillsides and lakes. It whines on about moral virtues like a sad minister in a derelict Episcopalian church preaching resignedly to a congregation of Sunday drivers and aging hippies. So what is next? Next, meaning for the environmental movement, is all or nothing, either a critical facelift for environmentalism or a long, slow slide into obsolescence. Medium as message is the message. A soft aesthetic produces soft results. So-called radical environmentalist and Little Red deep ecologist heart to our duty to preserve and caretake nature, poignantly calling for a profound paradigm shift that will allow the human race to see beyond its own wants, needs, and foibles to a higher love, quite a tall order for people who cannot decide whether to use paper or plastic. If we acknowledge the unlikelihood, there's the understatement of the century, the unlikelihood of such a shift coming about just because we asked for it, we are left with two options. We can throw up our hands in despair as I've pretty much done, or we can jump into the fray. We can do, in fact, what the far right has done so well since the advent of Ronald Reagan. Find base and selfish selling points for our product. Make people afraid not to buy. Wilderness and biodiversity conservation in the 21st century will mean national security, food security, atmospheric security, in short, survival. Environmentalists have a powerful product and the onus is on them to use powerful tools for the sale. But of course, doomsaying is not the ticket. Doomsaying, this is your, your, your doomsday preacher ham bone sermonizing on this uh, Tuesday afternoon. Uh, doomsaying in paradise. Okay, at least not the brand of doomsaying we have seen in the past which reminds the unconvinced of nothing so much as a nagging and petulant wife or a disgruntled fringe. Rather, environmental advertising has to define a new style for itself, a style with unapologetic momentum, a hardball playing, fast-moving engagement with the realities of anthropogenic devastation that does not shrink from the rude, the vicious, or the unsightly. Think of Richard Missark's stunning photography book, Violent Legacies, which features desecrated toxic landscapes 
rendered lovely by tragedy and good composition. Uh, then she recommends some other books that are uh, honest about uh, what's going on on this planet today. <clears throat> In pop culture, where music is loud, movies have turned into souped up roller coaster rides with only the vaguest of nods toward antiquated props like character and meaning and video games hurdle players through extreme landscapes at breakneck speeds, perpetrating violence as they go. There is no time for stately, quiet glimpses of scenic, far-off fjords. Oh, our legacy is not the landscapes nature gave us, the voluptuous tropics, or the lofty peaks of the Himalayas. These were the gifts we found waiting when we got up on Christmas morning. Our legacy is the wrapping paper we left crumpled and scattered around the house, the old bare trees we abandoned later on the sidewalk. These are the aesthetic forms we have made all by ourselves, the forms that speak to us of what we have done and what we stand to do. What environmentalism needs is not a well-meaning posse of smiling grannies handing out Hallmark cards in the mall, but the guts to assault us with the impacts of our own desires. Could not said it better myself. Lydia Millet, once again, highly, highly recommend the Bible of the Apocalypse, Naked Writers Uncover the Way We Live on Earth by Susan Zakin. And I'm going to get back to it here in this There you go, here's you some porno. Some porno from the Redwoods, where all is perfect on the planet. Bye guys.